A warm welcome and thank you for attending another virtual session of the U3A here in Amarnas. Admiral Johan Ratif is the former head of the South African Navy, and I am sure many of you will recall the fascinating lectures he has given us about naval incidents and some of the activities on sea. He is also a very keen amateur astronomer and very active in the local astronomy society in Hermanus. And both the Astronomy Society and the U3A have both benefited from some of the wonderful lectures that he has given us. They are always very well researched. So today's presentation about the voyage of the HMS Beagle with the famous Charles Darwin aboard will be equally interesting. And Johan, thank you for your preparation and we're certainly looking forward to it. Good morning, Gert. Good morning, Leticia. And good morning to all the listeners participating. I'm fascinated by Beagle, partly because I read Darwin's book about his voyage in the Beagle, and I thought I'd talk to you about it because my previous talk was the solution to the longitude problem, and this plays a major role in this presentation today. My bibliography I'm presenting as my second slide to tell you where all the uh, detail come from. The first one is the proceedings of the second expedition under command of uh, Captain Robert Fitzroy. It's his report of proceedings and it contains the best part of 700 pages. Uh, I'm going to go through it very, very spotily because otherwise we will stay all day long. It's excellent reading. It's available on the internet and I would advise you to uh, look it up if you wish. The second source that I quote is The Voyage of the Beagle as written by Charles Darwin in 1839. And um, still is his explanation of what he experienced in the ship and on shore. Also Wikipedia, you can look up HMS Beagle, Robert Fitzroy and Charles Darwin. And then the last one is the BBC television production, the series 1978, which consists of seven episodes of approximately one hour each. It is magnificent and it's well worthwhile seeing. Uh, it's available on YouTube and uh, I would recommend that if you have nothing to do and it's a cold, dreary day, switch it on and binge through it. It's really excellent. <clears throat> Where I show photographs of the Beagle, it is taken from the BBC TV production. We are borrowed. Okay, the Beagle built at Woolwich Dockyard, laid down in 1818, commissioned in 1820. It's a Cherokee, Cherokee class brig with a displacement of 342 tons. Length is 27.5 meters. This is quite a small ship. A beam of seven and a half meters, a draft of 3.8 meters. Um, and as I say, displacement of 242 tons. The, foot, the sketch at the left top shows it as a brig. A brig has two main masts or two masts, a foremast and a main mast. When Beagle was converted to a survey ship. They fitted a mizzen mast, which is this mast at the back here. And it is renamed because it has three masts as a bark. And you can spell it B A R K or B A R Q U A, but it's still a bark. The ship's company as a warship is 120. But as a survey vessel, it is 65, and in this case, it carried nine supernumeraries. It has 10 guns, but it was reduced to seven as a survey vessel. In 1825, the ship was converted to survey duties at Woolwich Dockyard, and I told you about fitting the mizzen mast. Right. The sails, 
this is the mizzen sail or the spanker four mast with the four mast with its sails the, the foresail the lower foresail the upper foresail oh my system doesn't work very well the uh, main mast with its main sail lower main sail and upper main sail and in the front you have a dip. Beagle on its first voyage, which I just mentioned briefly, was departed to Plymouth, 22nd May 1826, under command of Captain Pringle Stokes. <laughs> its mission was to assist Pachima's adventure with a survey of Patagonia and Terra del Fuego in South America. The survey process quite well, progress quite well. And but then on 2nd of August 1828 in Port Famine in the Strait of Magellan, Captain Stokes fell into a severe depression and he committed suicide. Uh, he locked him up in his cabin for 14 days and then he shot himself. He was not a good shot, he only passed away 12 days later. Vigo was then under the temporary command of Lieutenant William Skyling, who was the second in command, and sailed to return to Montevideo. Now, Montevideo was at that stage the headquarters of the South American station, where Rear Admiral Otway in HMS Ganges was the commander in chief South American station. He replaced Skyring with Lieutenant Robert Fitzroy. Now, Fitzroy at that stage was the flag lieutenant to Rear Admiral Otway, and he knew the chap quite well. Fitzroy returned to the railway, and amongst other things, after discovering the Beagle Channel, which I will tell you more about later, returns to Plymouth on 14 October 1830. And now I mentioned something called the boat story. What happened was when Fitzroy was surveying the Beagle Channel, some one of the locals, one of the uh, local people in the area, stole one of his boats. And he was not impressed by this. So he took hostage four members of the tribe, three men and one girl. And he kept them as surety that the boat would be returned, but it wasn't returned. So the four of them went back to England with Fitzroy, where he got the idea that he would educate them, teach them Christianity, and then later return them to um, the Beagle Strait to Terra del Frigo. Uh, and where they can start working amongst their own people. Keep this in mind, we, I will mention it again later. Just to orientate ourselves, enters the Strait of Magellan, is way over here. And the Strait of Magellan runs like that, and up on this side. The Beagle Channel is in the south here, come out on that side. Cape Horn or Cabo des Hornos is way down here. Port Famine, which is where the unfortunate predecessor of Captain Fitzroy committed suicide, is over there. This black line over here. is the border between Argentina and Chile. This area over here is part of Argentina. This area over here is Chile. Okay. The hydrographer of the Atlantic captain, Beaufort, wished 
that for the incomplete survey of South American coastline to continue. And also he required a ship to carry out the chain of meridional distances, longitudes, by returning to Plymouth across the Pacific and round the Cape of Goudou. Remember in the previous talk, we spoke about the use of the chronometer and how it was used to read of um, longitude. In preparing Beagle for the second voyage, which was to be under command of the same Captain Robert Fitzroy, various modifications were done to the ship. The upper deck was raised between 8 and 12 inches. The bottom of the sheath was new 2 inch fur and felt and copper uh, sheets. A new windlass was fitted instead of the capstan for the anchor. A new rudder was fitted. A stove and oven was fitted in place of the old galley range. Very important, lightning conductors were fitted to all masts, even the bowsprit, uh, and even the, the uh, bearing out spars of the mizzen. New spars, uh, okay, exposed or shipped in the ship. 20 chronometers was taken with four barometers of a special type, which was good for measuring altitude, new spars, sails, and rope. And later in the reel, the guns were replaced with brass guns to reduce the magnetic signature of the ship. Also important, which I only found out after I made this slide, was that a reel and depth line was fitted that could stand down to 300 meters. Normally, lead lines were, were handled by hand, but specifically to have the ship being capable of taking deep soundings, a special reel was fitted down off that could recover a deep line, uh, lead line with ease. First, Roy requested that the scientific person be invited to accompany him and uh, Professor Hensler was one of the people approached the Cambridge to ask whether he knew somebody and he knew Darwin well. Darwin at that stage was a naturalist, uh, a bit of a botanist, but actually he was a collector and an observer. He was recommended by Hensler and after an interview with Fitzroy was accepted and joined the ship as a scientific advisor. He took with him various books and also he was given a book on geology by Fitzroy uh, to help him in doing his task as scientific officer. Also joining the ship were two civilians, Mr. Earl, who was an artist. He later led the ship in Montevideo and the new artist was contractor, and a Mr. George Stebbing, who was an instrument maker, was required to do part of the maintenance and control of the chronometers on board. This is a, a plan view of the ship as fitted for um, survey work, ship's company of 94, 64 men and nine supernumeraries. Provisions included lots of anti-scorbid beautics, ripe apples, pickles, and lemon juice, preserved meat, vegetable soup, and from the medical department, they got ample supplies of antiseptics and articles for the preservation of specimens of natural history. Uh, the captain's cabin was down aft, officers and midshipmen on here, and uh, the Ship's company or the crew of sailors lived in their mess decks up the front. Storage area down below decks, plus water tanks. And uh, here is the new um, windlass for the recovery of the anchor cable, the coal locker, and the bread room. The three masts, four masts, 
Fomas, Mimas and Mizzenmas. People, this ship is quite small. For so many people on board, it must have been cramped conditions in the extreme. Beagle's mission was to sail via Madeira and Ten or Tenerife, Cape Verde Islands, Fernando Norono, which is a Brazilian island halfway across the South Atlantic, to the South American station. Beagle would be under the command, overall command of Adair Admiral Sir Thomas Baker, who was commander in chief of the South American station. The ship had to carry out surveys as indicated by the hydrographer's memo and to send reports at every opportunity of their, proceed, of their proceedings. On completion of the service in South America, it was proceed further in accordance with the hydrographer's further memorandum and returned to Falmouth. The uh, uh, hydrographer's memorandum is a massive document in itself. And it explains exactly what the hydrographer wanted them to serve. Amongst others, the Abrolas Bank of Brazil to find out the extent of the bank of the continental shelf to seaward. And this is about 400 nautical miles northeast of Rio de Janeiro. For that, they needed the deep lead line to take frequent soundings as they approached the bank. They had to stop at Montevideo to check the position and accuracy of the chronometers. In Rio de Janeiro, they had to take the exact position of Villa Gargon Island. Now that island, those of you who've been to Rio, it is right next to the airport, to the north of the airport, and it's a current uh, site of the Naval College. And it was previously surveyed before Beagle's time, and they wanted to check the latitude and longitude as previously determined with a new latitude and longitude. The main extent of the survey was from Rio de la Plata to the Strait of Magellan. Just to tell you, Montevideo over there, the river uh, Rio de la Plata, this river over here, Buenos Aires over there, they had to do Bahia Blanca. Um, today, that is a naval base. I've been there. They had to look at the Rio Negro. There was a rumor that the new Rego was navigable and that you could actually reach the Ganges by traveling up the river. This they tried, but it wasn't true. They had to look at Gulf of San Matias, Gulf of San George, this Gulf over here, Fort Desire, Bahia Grande, and the entrance to the Strait of Magellan. And then the northeast coast of Terra del Fuego, right down to Cabo San Diego. Entrance of the Beagle Channel, right up to the eastern side. This uh, etching is of the Beagle in the Strait of Magellan. The task of surveying. Briefly, it is to, to show you a chart eventually that shows you the things that you can't see the depth of the water, and the dangers to navigation. How do they achieve this? They actually draw the limits of the survey. They draw latitude and longitude grid. They set up beacons. Yeah, I've shown some beacons. And plot their positions accurately. Boats are used to obtain their soundings. And each boat is fitted with a compass, two sextants, one chronometer, one lead line to measure the depth and the bottom. Um, and the so-called left and right angles are measured with two sections simultaneously. 
When a sounding is taken, the following is written down in the book. The time, the left angle, the right angle, the depth of the water sounding, and if uh, the lead is prepared with beeswax at the bottom, they will get a uh, sample of the bottom and they will tell you what it is. The position of the boat at the time of the sounding over there is plotted with a device called a station pointer, where you can set up the left angle, the right angle by means of linear scales, and then you swing it and fit the legs of the uh, station point onto the beacons and it will rest right where you are. The track of the survey boat, there I show you a survey boat, is rather up and down perpendicular to the coast normally and the soundings are taken throughout. When Dr. Kotha spoke out to us about um, the uh, uh, the South African Cape's extinct landscape. She spoke about mowing the lawn. Now that is exactly what happens. The depth is measured with a lead line. Here is a picture of a lead line on the right. Uh, it's a reel with two handles and the line is marked with specific marks at every fathom. Uh, two fathoms, three fathoms, five, every two fathoms, sorry. And the person operating the lead line normally sits in the bow of the boat, chucks it head, and then gets a vertical reading. Seabed composition is determined with beeswax in the cavity of the lead. Bottom is a cavity. And uh, the seabed is normally rated as rocky, coarse sand, fine sand, or mud, or whatever else it is. Also shown in this uh, slide is the sextons that's used and the boat chronometer that's used to take the time. Why is the time important? It has to do with the state of tide but we will come to tides later. How do I know all this? Here's a picture taken in 1965 when I was the first year of midshipman, and I spent the June-July holiday in the South African service ship Natal together with all the other members of my class. I had two jobs on board. The one was to accompany the officer setting up the beacons ashore. My job was to carry the theodolite. And at sea, I spent a lot of time steering the survey launch and being walked around the air by the officer in charge of the launch if I couldn't steer a straight course. While the boats are servicing, there's a lot of action taking on board the ship. Uh, a survey ship is rather a bit like a factory. While the boats are away, the previous result, day's results have to be plotted on a fair chart. The beacons ashore have to be shifted once you get out of range of where they are. Coastline must be walked and surveyed and drawn on the fair chart. The height of tide must be measured and recorded. Today, uh, a depth recorder is used or tidal gauge is used to measure the tide. In the good old days, a measuring pole or stylo staff was planted in an area of wave where wave action wouldn't upset the water level, and the height of time was recorded by hand and with the use of a watch. And if possible, it was done for a full lunar month to give you a full idea of high tide, spring tides, new tides, and low tides. Tide tables had to be produced. Also, they have to identify landmarks, plot their positions ashore, they had to determine the height of the landmarks, so there was a shore party doing that, and they had fancy barometers that assisted in the measuring of the altitude of these landmarks. 
Landmarks as seen from seaward has to be sketched by an artist. Normally a line drawing on the side of the, the chart which gives you a good idea of what it is you see. The sailing directions had to be written. This is a narrative description of the sea area around the, the port or the harbor that's being surveyed, weather conditions, the related current, and tidal current and observed landmarks, leading marks have to be found and scribed. This was done by observation as well as by interviewing local experts. Local knowledge is extremely If deep water surveys, soundings had to be taken, <coughs> my apologies, it was the ship's job to do that. A I'm going to get a glass of water quickly. Just hold on. My apologies, I'm back online. I'm afraid my captain still is not here today. While the ship was busy surveying, Charles Darwin had ample time ashore to reconnoiter, collect, observe, and record. One of these characteristics that was expounded upon by Professor Ainsley was his ability to collect, to observe, and to record. He traveled by horse from Rio Negro, the river, I showed you where it was, over Patagonia, and met the ship again at Buenos Aires. He saw many things and wrote about many things. The picture you see here is of an armadillo on the left, and uh, um, Guanaco, the South American llama, on the right. I understand it's a family of a camel. Just at this stage to give you an idea of the voyage that carried out by the ship. They started up here, came round Cape Verde Islands, came to Bahia, then to Rio Janeiro, Montevideo, down here to Valparaiso, and the survey of the uh, Chilean coast, Lima, and then to the Galapagos, then across the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, to Sydney, New Zealand, Hobart, and then back to Bergwa. Back via the Indian Ocean, to Mauritius, Cape Town, to Bahia, and back to Palma for Plymouth. On the west coast of South America, Digo was tasked to carry out various surveys. Um, the Are west you on? Coast, How long was their entire yeah. voyage? How long was their entire voyage? Uh, five years. Five years. Huh? Yeah. It's a long time, huh? Well, we'll talk about that. On the west coast of South America, they started off the bottom, Gulf of Pinas was important. Then they had to survey the area around the island Grand of Chile, and the, the port over there is Port Moint, to Valdivia, and then to Talcahuana and Conception at the mouth of the Bio Bio River. And I've been to Talcahuana and Conception, then to Valparaiso, and then upwards towards Peru and Lima. Um, while they were surveying in the south, Darwin had the opportunity to uh, go and reconnoiter the Isle Grande de Chile, 
in that area. And he writes about it extensively in his book of the Voyage of the Beetle, of the Beagle. Um, while the ship was in Valdivia, um, a massive earth, earthquake shook, shook the area. And in the uh, vicinity of Conception on 20 February 1835, uh, and caused great destruction, about 500 people killed. Darwin had the opportunity to visit the devastation caused by the quake, and he writes about it extensively. On going north at Valparaiso, so in this area, this is uh, the current uh, main harbor and naval base, and Santiago, the capital, is about the way here. While the ship was serving this area, Darwin had the opportunity to visit Mendoza, which is a city in Argentina, and in the process, he crossed the um, Andes and, and then came back again. Um, to his surprise, he discovered fossilized seashells at a very high altitude in the mountains and made the deduction that, in fact, the mountains were lift, was actually underwater and was lifted up in the uh, reasonable past many, many million years ago. From Valparaiso, Beagle sailed northwards to Lima in Peru and from there westwards to the Galapagos Islands, which were surveyed in detail and a chart produced. This survey took some time and gave Darwin the opportunity to recognize a chalk. If you read the origin of species, you will find that a lot of, a lot of the deductions he made came from this area. The pictures on the right is a terrible thing called an iguana. They are both land and marine animals. And on the left, a tortoise. Here on the left is the chart, 1830, 1836 Admiralty chart of the Galapagos Islands. On the right, I've amplified the chart a bit so that you can have a better idea of what it looks like. Now, this, remember when you do survey work, a lot of the drawing of a chart like this is done by hand. People like Fitzroy, who was a meticulous surveyor, actually had the gift of drawing what they see very well. And if you read through his narrative of the voyage, you will see many sketches that he made of various tribesmen as he carried on his voyage around the area. Um, here you can see the soundings around the islands. There are not many soundings, but enough to give you an idea that the island has deep water, have deep water around them. Uh, in, in fact, are the top of sea mounts. Here's a modern topographical map of the Galapagos Islands. Uh, just to show you how well they, in fact, survey them. On the completion of the Galapagos, Beagles talked throughout the passages to confirm latitude and longitude of each of the islands visited. This is the part of the chain of meridional distances, also known as the chain of longitudes that had to be measured. The first stop after the Galapagos was the Tuamotu Archipelago, also known as the Disappointment Islands. They were low and dangerous atolls and coral reefs. The first uh, one they visited was Honden Island. In fact, it's Dutch for Dog Island. Visit to these atolls gave time to think to Darwin, who later describes how such atolls are fitted by sea bottom rising up, corals settling down on them, 
and then burning up, and then the mountain collapsing again. From a disappointment, and, and first of all, I make the point that this is a very dangerous area. But difficult to navigate and dangerous if you hit anything. His next stop was Tahiti. And first of all, the description of the island and its people is detailed and interesting and well worthwhile reading. On the 21st of December 1835, he arrived at New Zealand, starting off at Koro Rarika, now Rats, northeastern side of New Island. Fitzroy spends a lot of time describing the original people. He also mentions their dance of death as they prepare for war, probably known as the Haka today. He extensively toured New Zealand on horseback and by boat, and he recorded much of his concern about the white's land grab that was taking place in New Zealand on native land. This was to come back to haunting. In 1836, on the 11th of January, he had crossed over the ditch and he arrived at Sydney in Australia. After checking at uh, Parramatta Observatory the time and longitudes of his chronometers, he moved on first to Hobart, sorry, in Van Diemen's land or, or Tasmania, and then onwards to King George's Sound in Western Australia on the low, lower southwestern corner of uh, Australia, quite a bit below. From that area, he crossed the ocean and returned from um, measuring his longitudes and latitudes as he went. Keeling Island, now known as the Cocos Islands, is described in a great deal of detail. From Keeling Island, Beagle's Passage was slow, and he arrived there on the 29th April, 1836, departing again on the 9th May. Now, when you read his narrative, obviously, this area was well known, and he didn't waste a lot of time in writing about places like Mauritius and St. Helena and Ascension and the Cape Verde Islands. Um, the ship moved westwards, arriving at the Cape of Good Hope on the 31st of May. Once again, these chronometers were checked at the local observatory, 1836, and also Darwin had the opportunity to travel around the Cape Peninsula on horseback and made some geological observations. Passage from Cape Town to Falmouth was passed via St. Helena Ascension, Bahia, which was the first stop in Brazil on the way out. Pernambuco, it's also in South America, north of Brazil. The Cape Verde Islands, the Azores. And on the 2nd of October, 1836, he arrived in Falmouth, nearly five months later. On the 28th of October, he anchored at Greenwich, and the chronometer rates were certain, and thereafter, Beagle was paid off, and they are prepared for a second or a third voyage. Now, I haven't prepared a slide on it, but on the third voyage, Beagle returned not under his command. He handed over command of the ship, Beagle was prepared again, and went to Australia to do a survey of the Australian coasts under another captain. This, of course, is not written about by Captain Fitzroy. Now, what happened to Fitzroy? My apologies. Uh, in 1843, Fitzroy was appointed the second governor of New Zealand. 
after the first governor uh, passed away. He went to New Zealand and got himself involved with the ground issue and the fact that land grab was happening. He made all kinds of rules and regulations, which made him very pop unpopular, and eventually ended up in a war between the local citizens and the settlers. In September 8, 1948, he arrived back in Britain after being recalled. Firstly, by then, Vice Admiral was a pioneering meteorologist. In 1854, he established what was later known as the Met Office, a meteorological office, and he in introduced something called weather predictions, or as he called them, forecasts. He introduced fitted barometers at various ports to assist locals with weather predictions and instituted a system of when gales, when, of when gale, a warning system when gales were forecast. This was a warning system of cones which were hauled up against the local mast to show sailors that the weather is not good. The local Owners of fishing vessels did not like the system because it restricted their boats going to sea. And it was discontinued for some time, but then after they lost some boats, they realized that it was a good system and it was reinstituted. Poor Fitzroy, after financial concerns fading out, fading out and depression uh, led to his own suicide in 30 April 1865. And here ended the Fitzroy story. I would very much like you to re return to the bibliography. The proceedings of the second expedition, 1831-1836, is really an excellent book to read. Fitzroy himself is an excellent observer and had the ability to record what he saw in a most readable fashion. Similarly, the voyage of the Beagle as written by Charles Darwin is a lot easier reading than reading about his origin of species. Darwin, of course, when he was selected to go with Beagle, was an accomplished horseman and an avid hunter, so he knew his way around the shore. The book Voyage of the Beagle is readily available free of charge in electronic format of the Gutenberg project on the internet. Proceedings of the second expedition can be found on the internet um, looking up HMS Beagle and you will find it. And I return to my statement about the BBC TV production. If you're bored, and you wish to spend some interesting time, The Voyage of the Beagle is really a very excellent production. Right. Thank you, Johan, for a fascinating presentation and for all your preparation. Thank you, too, for all those that have participated this morning. I'm going to close the meeting now. Goodbye. <laughs>